Hey everybody, this is Eric Enga. I am the CEO of Stone Temple Consulting. You have reached the DMA show, so I sure hope that's where you were trying to get. But today is my favorite day of the month, and I call this First Tuesdays with David. Uh, it is the DMA show that we do on a monthly basis with David Amerland on the line with us. And uh, it's always a fantastic show because one thing I can promise you is that when 2 o'clock Eastern time rolls around, uh, David and Mark and I are going to be looking at, his, at each other and going, damn, where did all the time go? I mean, because that's just the way these shows end. And we, we just, uh, um, uh, I guess it's like school kids uh, babbling away about, uh, um, you know, the, their latest girlfriends or whatever they, you know, <laughs> they might be doing. <laughs> uh, the time runs away. So... If my wife is listening, I do not have any girlfriends. Uh, yeah. uh, that, that's good. I'm glad you clarified that. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to ask you guys to do your usual self-introductions. David? Uh, hello. Hi. And this is not a show about girlfriends. It's about semantic search and digital marketing. And I'm really thrilled to be here. And <laughs> I laugh so hard every time I come here because it's a really relaxed show. But I'm really thrilled because the comments and the quality of the content is actually spot on. And this is one of the rarest hangouts on the web right now in terms of the number of questions that come in and how targeted it is. So, um, you know, this is awesome. And Mark? Hi, I'm Mark Trapigan, um, the Senior Director of Online Marketing for Stone Temple Consulting. And David, you know, we always look forward to this, as Eric said. It's such a good time when you're around, and we all learn uh, something new every time that we talk. And we certainly hope that the folks that are watching do as well. It sounds like they do. Uh, as I as told David right before we went on the air, I just finished up my, my cup of Greek yogurt in his honor. Since <laughs> if you don't know, uh, David is based this time of year out of Greece. so. Um, I've got the I got the right lunch for the right DMA show, and we're ready to go. Looking forward to being with you. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, and today we want to actually specifically spend some time talking about the kinds of signals that search engines can use to uh, uh, you know give it information that it can use for semantic search, right? So, uh, what are the kind of clues that they can pick up on and uh, and and what what are those things that are available to them? So Mark, if you can, if you could go ahead and share the graphic, I'm going to blue box that for everybody to see. But um, this is a, a a graphic from an article that uh, I published very recently in social media uh, uh, today, um, and uh, actually David uh, Amerland. Uh, gave me uh, a lot of input uh, on this, so thank you very much for that, uh, David. But, You're very welcome. But, but the idea that we wanted to get across with this is that this is a, it's a very complex thing, and there's multiple types of issue, uh, things in play here. You have the searcher uh, that can be giving off different kinds of signals. We have the publisher that can be giving off other kinds of signals. And then there's other kinds of factors entirely. So it's really a, a, a rich array of different things that, uh, that can be in play. But to get the conversation going, um, you know, uh, David, I'm going to invite you to just talk a little bit about the graphic, and then let's just let the conversation uh, go wherever it chooses to go. OK, splendid. Thank you. And um, first of all, um, I love what you've done with this. I had some input in this, definitely. But um, you know, this, was, this has been um, Eric's project from the word go, and I was actually impressed that he was trying to do that, because um, when, you, when, when I first tried to visualize it, I didn't think it was going to be possible. And looking at the graphic now, we actually realized something um, straight off, which is that semantic search is a very complex thing. And literally, it's the closest thing we've got to rocket science in search right now. There are a lot of factors at play. Um, the, the beauty of it is that its impact and the way we understand it is very, very simple and very logical because it contextualizes results at the interface where we actually use them. But in order to do this, it has to do something amazing. It basically has to understand who we are, what we do, and what we're trying to do. And then it has to bring everything together in terms of a search query, which is basically information and data. So the factors which we play with at every time um, have to do, it's a triptych, basically, you know, like a tripod, one of the most unstable structures ever, because everything has to work uh, at the same time and at an equal value. 
and there's us as the individual and the signals we give off are part and parcel of the equation. There's of course the search engine itself and search technology and then there's also those who actually output content and what they're trying to do. And all those things come together in one seamless whole which is ever evolving. And one of the difficulties when it comes to semantic search is that every time we talk about it it seems to have evolved a little bit more and the factors seem to have changed as well. And a classic example of this, and you know, after the Hangout is over, those of you who are watching, if you go to google.com and put in the search query uh, vegetables rich in iron, you will get a very rich intera interactive um, knowledge graph where you'll be able to get a drop-down list of all the vegetables in alphabetical order, which are rich in iron. Then get the quantities, which you can also play with, and as you change the vegetable and the quantity, on the right-hand side of the knowledge graph, all the statistics actually change. It's fantastic. It's you know fantastic knowledge at your fingertips. The amount of information which it takes to achieve something relatively simple, which is simple for us to use, um, on the web, is is you know humongous, and sort of showcases where um, a lot of the challenges come in place. Because the moment you scale something, obviously, um, other other factors kick in. So it, it's really interesting. And, and Mark, you don't have to leave yourself off the screen forever if you want. Uh, you are welcome to rejoin us and not be just a nameless graphic. But um, the, uh, the, the, you, you brought up very specifically the knowledge graph, which is very tied to a database yes. uh, or a series of databases that Google has that ties very specific kinds of facts together. Um, and allows them to answer certain kinds of queries. But semantic search isn't just about the knowledge graph. Um, no, it isn't. It's uh, also about entities. And entities is also um, a factor. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult concept to get one's head round of. Um, and, and that's because we at a human level use words. So you think the word is an entity. But it's not. I mean, the moment you say, for instance, vegetable, and everybody sort of understands what vegetable is, it really, the word itself doesn't actually mean that. The word is the what we use to describe a concept, and the concept is something which um, has particular attributes associated with it and um, has a particular existence, and it's all those things which actually create the concept. And if we map that onto another language, then, you know, that is transferred across. And when we get to entities, essentially what is happening? Search is understanding things, have an existence, in real space the way we understand them. And again, that's a bit mind-blowing because we never really had it in the past. And we see that in conversational search, certainly, uh, when you can answer back to us and link our sentences and understand them. But we can also see it in the depth of information we can pull up now in terms of specific subjects. And here's the beauty of it and also the disappointment right now. Because the moment we describe it in these terms, everybody thinks, wow, this is fantastic, and they go on the web and then carry out some sort of a search. So, and, and the results are very poor. <laughs> and the reason they're very poor is because semantic search, in order to scale, takes time. Uh, at the moment, the um, entity graph has, I think, 800 million items. Um, a knowledge graph is about an equal number. And these are not enough. We need billions in order to actually describe the real world in any kind of depth, and it's ever-evolving. So when we get poor results, it's because we're not quite there yet. And sometimes, depending on the search query, we get mixed results, where you get semantic search results, and then you get the gaps being filled in by traditional search results. And um, tests carried out on that front, although intuitively we think we'll get the best of both worlds, actually show that we, this doesn't happen. At the moment, um, Boolean search, which is the old search, uh, the search of the past, gets mixed into semantic search results. What happens is the first three results usually have a higher rate of accuracy than before, but every other link after that drops off dramatically, so that it actually degrades quite quickly. So this is a source of a disappointment, but it's also a sign for hope because things are constantly evolving. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, here, uh, since you mentioned uh, this notion of uh, entities, I've got a little uh, chart here. Um, oh, yes. So there's an entity, it's a football team called the New England Patriots, uh, and I should say an American football team. Of course. Uh, <laughs> because it mean, the word football means different things to other Eric, people. Eric, didn't you mean America's football team when we were talking about <laughs> Yes, well, I did. Thank you for yes. clarifying that. Yes. 
Um, uh, it's certainly my point of view on the subject matter. I appreciate uh, uh, you're, you're calling everybody out to that same level of uh, understanding of the way it works. But um, but there's uh, first of all, it's knowing that they're a, a football team, that they're in a league, they have players, who who the players are. They're in a division uh, or a conference called the AFC East, uh, and there are other teams in that division. And these are all attributes or relationships um, that this entity uh, has. So so, but since we're uh, Want to focus I was going to say, that's a, that's a fantastic graphic you put together because essentially on the right hand side where the attributes appeared, it can constantly evolve because some of them are cultural based and some are knowledge based and they don't stay static. And that shows that there's a certain refinement that goes on with entities, which also has to be mirrored within Google semantic search and the entity index, or semantic index I should say. And, and the, that's again a challenge because you know if we think about it, we're asking search now to constantly mirror our ever-evolving world at a high level of accuracy, which is good enough for it to actually connect with us at an intelligent interface or intelligent level. It's a tall order, and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, one step at a time, right? It's a journey, basically. It is absolutely. Yeah. So, um, but let, let's talk about, uh, since that's the theme of the show, some of the ranking factors. And by the way, for those of you who are asking questions, thank you so much. We are going to get to them. I just want to set the stage a little bit more before we dive into the specific uh, questions. Uh, um, although uh, Mark uh, has kindly uh, popped the, uh, the link for the social media today article in the comment stream for those looking for that. Um, but let's actually talk about some of the different factors uh, um, that uh, are going into this. Yeah, definitely. And, and again, when we talk about ranking factors, in the past we had uh, you know, the tradition, traditional 200 odd ranking factors that we used to go into search. And they, you, know, you more or less knew the, the, the main ones, the primary ones, which used to be link building and the age of our website and the number of keywords and the keywords in the URL, et cetera. And you could pretty much predict if a website is going to go on, on the first page of Google or not in response to a search query. And now we can't do that. And the reason we can't do that is because it's not just what is inside a website, but it's also how valuable it is. So when the website gets ranked, the ranking factors now run along the lines of quality as well as the quantity of content, links, age, etc. And then that gets refined even more by the website's own social signal, which you, Google uses as a verification process almost as to the importance of the website and its appeal to the audience. So it's almost like a little bit, to visualize it, uh, a crowdsourcing of quality, if you like, or a crowdsourcing of importance. It's a little bit more nuanced than that, but you know, in the general lines, this is exactly what's happening. And this has an, a very interesting effect. We certainly, from a knowledge point of view, we can analyze the ranking factors of a modern website today in semantic search, but they are a constantly moving target, which is constantly being refined. And if we focus, you know, one of the things which we say about semantic search is that it is, you know, gaming is over. It is very difficult to game. Well, it's mathematics, right? And we spend a lot of time anal analyzing it and trying to understand it. So by the same token, if we spend all this time doing that, then we know pretty much how to game it, right? And the answer is yes, but because it is so nuanced and because it is so time intensive to actually try and game it, you don't actually gain anything because the very definition of gaming is that you actually gain an economic shortcut. You do something which gets you somewhere faster at a lot less effort than if you actually try to do it the right way. In semantic search, this doesn't happen. So your gaming activity is just as labor intensive and perhaps economically um, expensive, financially expensive, as if you try to do the same thing, the right thing. So because of that, yes? I don't, didn't want to interrupt you. Go ahead and finish. OK. So because of that, by and large, gaming behavior within the semantic web is largely over. Now, having said that, of course, there's still verticals and there's still factors where you know, things work. And sometimes they work for a short period of time. Sometimes they work for a longer period of time. So perfect just yet, it ain't. But it's getting there. And this is something really important to have in mind, because if you're still trying to game it, what's happening is you're going to find yourself falling further and further behind. Your mind shift hasn't 
happened, so your mind is still stuck in the past, and you'll find yourself at some point suddenly when you have absolutely no choice but to do what everybody else is doing, and by then you'll be too far behind to actually catch up. So it's so David, better to get... Yeah. So David, I'm a, I'm a small site owner. Um, I don't mean stature, I am that too. But, uh, you know, I, I run a small website, I run a small business, you know, I don't have a lot of time uh, to invest, but I know I need to be moving in this direction. You've told me a lot about what I shouldn't be doing and the things that used to work that don't work. Can you give me a few things um, that I should be doing to prepare for the, the world of semantic search? What, what's the top things that, you know, that as a site Absolutely. owner I should be doing? Yes, definitely, and thank you. That's a, that's a really good question. Okay, one of the things which actually without getting into the technicalities of structured markup just yet and structured data markup, we look at the way that information is structured on a website. And if you, if you have a small website, you're a small, um, relatively small business owner, you haven't got a lot of time, the first thing you should be look, do, looking at doing at every step of the way is clarifying the information of your website and creating small classifications which make it easier to index and easier to group. So rather than having, for instance, information all over the place. And you may have a blog, for instance, which can have, you know, a dozen topics. And that was okay in the past because what was important was your blog activity as opposed to your content topic activity. But now this is will serve you better if you start grouping your subjects and your writing activity to something which is subject specific. So you begin to create um, classifications within your own website which in themselves become uh, indexing clusters and they're easier to see. Also, you should be looking at your website um, structure in terms of layout. If a visitor comes on your website and at a glance can't see how to navigate it, can't see what you're about, well, the chances are that it's disorganized in terms of its thinking sufficiently for search to also have a little bit of trouble understanding what it's about in the first instance. And, and that is, it is something which you definitely should be looking at. So creating clarity on the web is the primary thing and the primary, you know, your primary focus, really. And the other thing we should be doing is trying to, I will contextualize this, is trying to find your audience. And you say, okay, what does that entail? Well, you know, as a business, you have a specific audience in mind and you, specific, you, you specifically speak that language which appeals to that audience and allows you to connect with them. Well, you should be able to find that audience wherever they may be. They might be on Twitter, they might be on Facebook, they might be on Google Plus or any other social um, not network like LinkedIn you should begin the process of actually finding that audience which will stay with you, will resonate in terms of what you do, and they will help you amplify your message on the social web, which is through interaction, engagement, and sharing and resharing of your content. So I'll just add a, a couple of thoughts, right, which is, uh, I'll give you a tagline for it, uh, which is create visible value and relationships. Absolutely. <laughs> That's absolutely right. right. Yes, yeah, um, and I mean, the, the moment you say that, I mean, it, it is something which, as marketers, we intuitively understand, and you're absolutely 110% right when you say that. It has always, as Mark said, you know, if you get into the small business uh, site owner, it has to be contextualized into relatively simple steps because it, they still struggle sometimes with what they have to do with SEO, and they certainly struggle with time. Yeah, no, and time is definitely a big issue, and that's why it's a... Uh, so important, I think, for them to stay focused in their area of expertise and not go drifting off into other areas where they won't have the time to do a very high quality job. So just re really excel at, at what you're good at and add that value and then build relationships around you. And, and as I'm fond of saying, I mean, it, obviously everybody talks about influencers and authorities and building relationships with them, and, and that's very smart and very good but you can't make that the only thing you're doing. You have to be building an audience, and there has to be the people that you're working hard to help and bring value to, um, So, um, um, because that audience is just as important as the influence of relationships, in my view, in a, in a rich uh, semantic web. Absolutely right, and, and Eric, thank you very much for bringing this up now, because Influence, influencer leveraging, which essentially allows you to tap into an influencer's ready-made network and become known through that, is a classic marketing scenario which can actually work for a small business owner. And then you say, okay, how do I do that? And it comes back to the original uh, basis for creating any kind of content. It has to be quality driven. It has to be absolutely top-notch because essentially influencers will only share and promote 
content which resonates well on them in terms of reputational value. And it sounds very crass and very cold and very you know, marketing sort of orientated, but this is the reality of it. The reason this happens is because they act to a degree as guardians of their own network because of the trust factor involved. So those who tap into their network and choose to follow them or choose to engage with them are used to a certain level of quality. So no influence is actually going to share anything simply because they like you or simply because you know you follow them around and you plus one or all their stuff or you share it. What you produce has to actually have that resonance of validity and quality which will allow them to say, hey, you know, this is really cool. You should keep an eye on this. So bear this in mind. Yeah, David, I'm, I'm really fixated right now on the idea of the value of an audience. I'm reading a book um, by Jeffrey Rohrs, uh, R-O-H-R-S, uh, that's by that very title, Audience, and talks about the importance of an audience. And I like the way that he terms it, that you, uh, it says you should never talk about your audience like you own it. You never own the audience. He uses the term a proprietary audience. You can earn an audience, but you always have to realize that audience can, you know, can go somewhere else tomorrow. Uh, so you have to keep re-earning it every day. You have to constantly be working to uh, keep their attention you know, toward you, to earn their trust, their relationship, and all that is building what we're talking about here, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Mark, thank you very much. Again, this is a hugely important point. I can't stress it enough. Again, and the temptation there is to think that, you know, influencers are some kind of magic shepherd, you know, with a an army of 300,000 followers will do whatever they say. And this is not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, the moment you're an influencer, you're in a position of trust, as, as Mark has just pointed out. And essentially, you are being judged every single day. You're being judged by the way you behave on the web, which becomes a guideline for those who follow you. You're being judged by the content which you share, which allows those who follow you to actually decide, are you valuable enough? Do you enrich their stream? Do you enrich their knowledge base? Do you enrich their view of the world or not? And also you're being judged by the way you interact with other people around you, who many of whom will not be in the same stature, whatever the stature may be, as you. And again, this is a guideline in terms of how we behave on the web. In a semantic web, everything is transparent. Everything is under constant um, judgment, basically. It's almost like a panopticon world. We're all being watched 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So that has a very significant effect in the way we behave and in the things we do. And we have to keep this in mind. You know, it's a, we say it's a value-driven, quality-orientated world for a reason. If things don't actually have value, to do something which is pointless wastes everybody's time, and nobody has time to waste. And, and this is something worth bearing in mind. And if you think about it, too, I mean, since we um, you know, have the theme of, of you know, what are the things that are driving semantic search and what are the factors, a very simple high-level way of expressing that is that the uh, Google and search engines in general want to learn how to evaluate what's quality and what's most likely to satisfy users. Well, the same way users do. Well, that's a shocking this, concept. Absolutely, this is absolutely staggering. Now, in the first instance, this is relatively easy to do, and I say relatively with a huge qualification here on relatively. But if we crowdsource online behavior, we can basically reach a fairly satisfactory uh, definition of quality. So if I have a website and I manage to get 100 people there and only one stays longer than 15 seconds, well, you can say perhaps the user experience of my website is not what, it's, what I suppose it to be. So, you know, Google thinks, okay, you know, David's website perhaps is not the best in the world. If, on the other hand, you know, they stay for two, three minutes each and they view more than one page, that is also an indication that the website is actually has some kind of value and delivers some kind of end user quality. But that's a very oversimplified view. Uh, Google actually, and certainly going on from here towards the future, looks at things in a, in a much more nuanced way even. Um, certainly within their deep learning, uh, sorry, machine learning um, uh, algorithms, which are essentially artificial intelligence, which uses specific rules to scale the um, understanding of what it sees and then reach qualitative judgments, the way you and I do. Um, they, they do that, and they, they actually have found a couple of things. They found that if they use more than one algorithm and they use that in more than one machine, 
and then they create a Darwinistic environment almost. Machines learn faster and the quality scales a lot faster than if they did it on one. And what that means to us is that semantic search is scaling a lot faster in its terms of its understanding than even we thought possible. You know, we thought perhaps we're going to be where we are now um, you know, a year from now, and actually we haven't. We, you know, we'll see the results a lot faster, which means by the time we get to the end of this year, the progression is not linear. It goes by leaps and bounds. So it's almost like geometric um, iteration. So we'll see a huge improvement. So we get to the year to, to the end of 2016, and it'll be so massively improved, one of them realized that you know we had this kind of conversations in the past. Right. It's like the uh, four-year-old child at the moment, or the two-year-old child, and the Learning yes. is really about the scale in, in a big way. Yeah, right. as a matter of fact, you're right. If you think of it as a child, instead of growing linearly and going, you know, four years, five, it sort of goes four, eight, 12, 18. You know, it's kind of a kind of leap. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right, I'm going to uh, actually pop in one of these questions because somebody's okay. asking here a question from Tim Longwell. How does the new rel equals author fit into the new semantic search, and uh, is, is that uh, in play here at some level? Yeah, I, I was going to say absolutely not. <laughs> well, without me seeing how we've got Mark Traphagen, <laughs> seeing how we've got Mark Traphagen here, who's from the very beginning of Google Plus, actually realized the importance of um, rel authorship and carried out initial tests on this. It is critically important. Why is it critically important? Well, it allows us to do a few things. Bearing in mind that Google Plus, in effect, is an identity service. Knowing what you do um, through Google authorship allows you to lay claim to content which you have created on the web. This helps your profile, certainly helps your expertise. And um, it also helps in terms of the uh, authority that your profile begins to accumulate because um, it, it does a couple of other things. It brings up your thumbnail in search, which becomes part of the social proof, which engages, increases engagement and gives us a crowd sourcing signal of trust, perhaps. Uh, and certainly it also allows the profile itself to create a kind of authority based on the ag aggregation of all those signals. It's a very nuanced thing. It's not a linear thing. You know, the, the, the temptation here is to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to apply it. And the moment I apply it, I'm going to have more people on my website, and I'm going to get my content ranking higher. Okay, this is not how it works at all. As a matter of fact, you know, you may even see the opposite because there, there'd probably be a, a trial and error kind of um, of a period in terms of of how Google sees it. And Google has certainly begun to um, uh, sift through uh, authorship itself. They have said that you know if you apply it automatically, it doesn't mean you're going to get it. You know they need to be convinced that you're delivering value on their web, and that your profile is actually worth following. Otherwise, you know why would they waste essentially what is valuable real estate in search in promoting somebody who is not doing the right thing, so it's not delivering value. Best way to see it is like a, a calling card, like you would have in real life. It has to have value, has to look good, but it also has to have substance behind it. Otherwise, it's just a, a wasted calling card. And um, Google has, I think Mark will probably be able to verify this, they have begun testing in um, ascribing authorship even when it's not actually claimed. And I'm not quite sure where they're up to on this, but perhaps you can tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, we, we've been seeing that for a while now, at least since uh, the beginning of 2012, where we'll see what we call auto-attributed um, auto authorship, where if Google uh, looks at a page sees a name on it, particularly with a byline, like by Mark Trapagan, and <clears throat> by whatever means they feel like there's a reasonable chance that's this Mark Trapagan, um, <clears throat> excuse me, even if there's not authorship markup on that page, they will sometimes go ahead and attribute authorship. And we'll see there is a confidence level behind that because we, we, we typically see it, well, I'll qualify that in a moment. I mean, we typically see that most often and most accurately if the person's very well known. Um, I've always used the example of, you know, I've observed for years that, you know, Chris Brogan um, never connects anything to authorship. He's never used rel equals auth that I can find in any of his sites where he publishes content, but he consistently gets an authorship result for his content. Google has high confidence that, you know, his site is associated with him, and so they're going to go ahead and display that. Now, the other hand, you know, it's an experiment where, and we, it's an opportunity to see that we're still in the baby steps of this because, we quite often, I think Eric brought this out in his recent article on uh, author rank, 
and why uh, why isn't it around yet? Why isn't it something we need to be fixated on yet? Um, we we fairly often see wrong attributions of authorship, uh, especially on multi-author sites and where the authors aren't well known. Uh, Google will get confused and give authorship to the wrong person sometimes. So uh, they're still building the confidence in that signal, and they've got some ways to go. They're learning more. The the exciting thing is they certainly haven't given up on it. You know, even though some people are taking it as a negative that, as you said, starting in December they started uh, cutting back on the amount of authorship they're showing and trying to increase the quality of that. That shows they're committed to the program. Uh, they they still want to do this. They want to learn who we are, who what content we're connected with, and what are the signals that indicate that that's that content has authority and therefore that person has authority in a particular topic area. Right, and if we try to tie tie all this together, right, uh, um, uh, you know, what I argued in my article uh, is, as just as you said, Mark, is that author rank isn't here in the sense that uh, um, I don't see any evidence, and I, I don't think you do as well, that uh, um, having proper authorship attribution is causing things to rank higher for people. But it still plays a big role in semantic search already today because if there are connections, like somebody's following somebody on Google+, uh, then it can play a role in, in delivering personalized results. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I think that, that's, you know, it's an important quantification because it leads us quite naturally into what we talk about you know, we're in a world where, which is governed by two um, economies which are side by side. One is the relationship economy and the other one is the attention economy and they're linked very closely. And indeed, you know, the whole um, effort that goes into marketing and into search marketing, into uh, search, um, uh, using search constructively and creatively is to create relationships through a social network and then use them in, in, a, in a sort of a mutually beneficial way so that the audience and the person who creates them benefit equally, content rises to the surface, um, visibility increases, authority and trust are generated. And that also leads into the attention economy because at the end of the day the whole focus on quality is comes down to attention. They're only 24 hours in a day and this is not going to change no matter what happens to technology. They're only so many 60 minutes in an hour <laughs> unless we change planets of course. <laughs> I must preface this. <laughs> there you so, go. See, now, now we've got a way to solve that one too. We're, yes, we, we do. Virgin uh, Galactic will solve that one for us. <laughs> but um, you know, there's only 60 minutes a day, and if I require you to spend three of those minutes looking at my content, I better make damn sure that it's actually worth your time. Otherwise, you're not going to give me your attention again, and I'm unlikely to ever have you again as part of my audience. And this shows just how difficult this is. This, you know, I have to have a very close affinity to what you're looking for. I have to have a certain amount of confidence in what I'm actually producing as a content producer. Uh, and, and the audience itself, you know, when they actually spend the time, there's a trust factor involved because if they don't know somebody, it is hardly unlikely that they will go and click on their content if they haven't heard something good about them or if their perception of them isn't good, which is where reputation comes in. So trust, reputation, and authority now, they come into part and parcel semantic search. And uh, uh, this is something which um, Eric's um, company must see time and again because they work in the content production and content generation area. And they understand exactly how difficult it is in terms of their customers. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to actually throw up a question from John Britzios here. I don't think it's all going to fit. Uh, but uh, um, it, it appears that he's tying this notion of semantic search to uh, sites delivering uh, structured data. Yes. Um, and it's a lot broader than that, isn't it? It is, absolutely. I'm very glad you, I'm glad you brought this up, uh, John. Okay, let's look at structured data and what it is. Now, essentially, structured data markup, and it has three different flavors in this, um, is, is basically a way of putting data on the web in a way that is better indexed by Google search, uh, semantic search, and better understood, and it better goes into the semantic search index. 
And the moment we say that, you think, aha, you know, this is the golden shortcut we've all been looking for. This is what we should be implementing. And I must say that although Google have actually put their weight behind schema.org, they are implementing their own version of it, and they have said this, which means they're not 100% committed to that. And also they know that if uh, it's something which is user-generated, we get two things. First of all, we get the old-fashioned gaming behavior where you say, oh, well, you know, what if I do this? And the second thing, which is also equally serious, is the human error factor because we all make mistakes. So you create structured data, which is wrong perhaps because, you know, you weren't paying attention, you were doing it in the middle of the night and you were tired and so on. So basically, Google is committed here to um, indexing the world's information on the web in a structured format way by taking unstructured data and putting it into its uh, semantic index in a structured way. So, so David, are you saying that they can do that to a certain extent? They're going to get better and better at doing that even if the website doesn't have schema data on it, doesn't structure yes. data? Because that's yes, the second absolutely. part of John's question. He was asking, you know, what if the vast majority of websites still don't adopt it? Is that going to hamper uh, semantic search? Well, Google understands that it's very difficult to actually implement structured data, especially if the website is dynamic and you create content all the time. Um, because uh, there's no CMS today, which is a content management system that allows you to do that. So it has to be done manually. If you do it manually, you need to know a little bit about programming, which means that you, know, you may be tempted to gain things or you may get things wrong. If neither of those things happen, still you're in a minority of people who know uh, programming and can actually apply it. So Google is committed to basically taking the data they find in the average plain vanilla website, which hasn't got any kind of structured data in any kind of way, and um, through a process which is called uh, entity, <laughs> entity uh, extraction, they extract basically all the elements they need in order to create a structured data uh, picture of that website. Yeah, absolutely. And and in Eric's classic fashion, I forgot to unplug my phone. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. I think, yeah, uh, uh, one phone call. Uh, Maybe it's somebody uh, trying to call in a question. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> it's, um, it's a call. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but what I want to do uh, before I run over and unplug the phone, I'm going to tee up the next question this way, which is. Okay. Um, I, I think uh, you know if you go back to uh, the semantic search uh, uh, graphic, uh, Mark. I don't know if you could fire that back up again easily or not. Still got it here. Uh, but um, th there's many kinds of factors that have nothing to do with markup at all, right? So yep. uh, the fact that I'm sitting in Framingham, Massachusetts, isn't a markup issue. Uh, it's an issue of uh, Google automatically detecting where I am, or the fact that I have a search history, um, and uh, you know, my I did a search on Rome, and then my very next search is on hotels. That's search history in action. Google can say, well, it just searched on Rome, so let me make sure I include at least some results related to Rome hotels in here. And there's so many things that have nothing to do with markup, right? Who, uh, who my social connections are, the language used, right? Does the publisher use a given term to, you know, let's say you have a publisher, instead of using the word appliances, uses the word kitchen electrics. Um, who knows why they would do that, but let's just say they did for some reason. Um, and, and in my search query, I use something that sounds more like kitchen electrics. Google might decide because of that language difference that there's a, a stronger reason to make that link, although it sounds like old-fashioned keyword stuff. So there's a lot of things that have nothing to do with markup on your website in this whole picture. And now I'm going to run and unplug my phone. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, markup is only a small part of it, and right now there's so little um, of it implemented across the web that it absolutely confers no... Um, advantage whatsoever in terms of ranking. Certainly, if you can do, if you can implement um, structured markup on your website, I would say, you know, always do it because anything which you do which helps your website become indexed in, uh, better and more easily by search is definitely something you should be doing. Uh, David, let me, let me throw up a question here uh, while waiting for Eric to come back. And this one, see back. if you, oh, okay. Well, but, I just but go ahead and throw up your question. Okay, well, I, I just, 
unpinned it instead of hitting the eyeball. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was, I wanted to see if you understood it. I'm not quite sure. Uh, let me see if I can find it here quickly because he, 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 he reposted it uh, just a few minutes ago. Which question uh, was it? This was from Denver Prophet. Uh, he was asking if it's necessary to use schema markup in order to use schema product and schema event. Does that make any sense to yes. you? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. There have, this has to be a certain amount of compatibility. I mean, there's one thing. Certainly when you're actually implementing uh, a specific structured data markup, because you have schema.org markup, you have micro formats, you can use R RDFA, and if you use any of those three, you should actually be consistent in what you're actually doing. Um, because any kind of incon inconsistency conceivably may raise red flags here, and um, you know you need you need to actually be um, you know apply one throughout your website or not apply any, any at all. Fair enough. I'm going to throw up another question. Uh, this one is from Steve Bonin. On uh, do you believe that semantic search will help local businesses compete in search? Okay, that's an excellent question. In, in, at the end of the day, semantic search is there to deliver the right kind of information at the right time to the right person. So if we think this in, in terms of context, you know, some local search is a brilliant place for this to happen. So the, the short answer to this is absolutely yes. For that to happen, of course, the magic really is to get the data out there and make sure that you have all the connections possible that you can. If you're a local business, you should have Google Plus um, local pages. You should have reviews. If you have reviews possible, you should have physical address on Google Maps. You should be actually you know, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's in order to be able to show up on local search. So don't expect Google to come and say, knock on your door and say, hey, your website is not there or your business is not there. That's your job. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just the very fact of locality, I mean, location-based aspects of, of search have been around for some time, so I think that's already been helping businesses at that level, but if you are doing the right things with your site and content to reinforce that, I think that's, a, that's really a, a, a big deal. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to throw up one from Vivek uh, here. Um, so big brands can spend a lot of money on advertising and whether or not it gives them any returns or not, they don't care. All companies have to be careful about that. So is it correct to adopt uh, the same approach for marketing and the rest of it is many marketers seem to do that. What does the panel think? Um, okay, now <clears throat> when it comes to advertising, I think it's always a losing proposition for a small business to try to play in the same way as a large company um, because of the mismatch in terms of manpower and certainly the mismatch in terms of budgets. And if you consider, if you sort of um, use the analogy of a fight, it's like a lightweight fighter who may be really, really good in his division going up against the heavyweight fighter. Well, you know, he's really good in his division. Now, in terms of skill levels, the lightweight fighter might be even better than the heavyweight fighter, but it only takes a couple of punches from the heavyweight fighter and you really feel the pain. So really, you shouldn't be trying to fight them um, at their game. You should be actually trying to do what you're really good at. If you're a small company, you need to work cleverly. How do you do that? You leverage your clientele. You leverage your social connections. You make sure that your name is on social networks. You make sure that you get reviews if you're a local business. You make sure that those who... Um, actually step through and do business with you, have a reason to shout out about it to their friends. They go on Twitter and they tweet about it because they're so happy. They you know, go on Facebook or they come on G+, and they certainly tell everybody that you know, they know you, you're fantastic, here's a link to your profile or your business page, and what a great service they received. Now, this is something which large companies can't actually do. And we know that the audience, which is us essentially as consumers, have become more and more resistant to classic advertising. They throw big budgets and you know big shows at us, and we say, yeah, great, fantastic, but so what? So really, what we want to know is, are they going to listen to us? Are they going to treat us like people? If there's a problem, are they going to actually empathize and try and solve it quickly? We really need that human connection in order to trust them enough for us to make a purchase, because at the end of the day, we're giving them our money. So we're asking now brands to be like people. So you know, as for a small business, this is an advantage. This is your time in the sun, as it were. 
So you really need to work cleverly and try to capitalize on that. I think that's great to emphasize, David, that this is really the things we're talking about in ways can be the great equalizers for small businesses, small companies. A lot of times we assume that a big company has all these unlimited resources for social media engagement and content creation. And a lot of times, you know this, we know this, you get inside those big mega companies and you're amazed at how small the departments are that do these things. And they, yes. the scale, because they're getting, you know, customer complaints and they're getting tweets and they're getting all, that are just, you know, off the charts and yet they only have a few people uh, yes. handling all of that and monitoring yes. it. Yes, so and I can actually, yeah. That's, you're engaging, you're, you know, you can, you can actually get an advantage over those those big guys. Yeah, that's a fantastic point, and thank you very much for actually saying that. I can actually give a practical example without naming a company um, where I was privy to um, a discussion, and I was there, and essentially they, you know, they have, they're doing the right thing. They have a social media team which does content marketing, and then they have an engagement team, which is a different department, different boss, different budget. And you think, okay, you know, what does the engagement team do? Well, the engagement does engagement on social media. <laughs> and those two teams are basically working at odds with each other. So mm -hmm. suddenly something which should be a strength for a large company, because of the internal structures and internal power plays, actually becomes um, a minus, and they're not working as effectively as they should. And this, again, comes down to being the great equalizer, because if you're a small business, well, your content marketing team and your engagement team is probably going to be you. So that's a lot easier <laughs> to actually manage than having you know, a team of four or five or six people with a manager and a budget, and again, again another team of four or five or six people with a manager and a budget, and they all have you know, offices and they're all vying for careers and power and more money for next year's budget and so on. So that gives you an example, a real life example, of how difficult it is for large companies to actually do well on the social media web because they don't quite get the human factor just yet. So as a small business, you definitely have a strength, and your strength is exactly the same thing that makes you weak. You haven't got many people. You have to do most things yourself and wear most hats. Well, use that to your strength, turn it around, personalize everything you do, get the empathy factor out there, the human factor which connects, and make things happen that way. Yeah, so one, one way I like to think about it is, uh, you know, you, you use your example of the large, you know, the, the heavyweight fighter. <coughs> and and you don't want them to land a punch on you, but you got to remember that heavyweight fighter, if we just use the United States as an example, is probably looking at uh, things at a national scale, and the amount of attention that they're spending on Framingham, Massachusetts is minuscule. And not only that, as you said, they're conflicted with each other. So um, yeah. there's actually um, a third of the punches they throw are actually hitting themselves in the face. <laughs> um, and they're not even attempting to hit anybody else because of the internal conflicts, right? Yes, um, exactly. And meanwhile, you, as the, the lightweight, are nimble, quick, and focused. Mm. Right? Exactly. I mean, these, these are fantastic qualities, you're right. Right. And, and so those are really, really, really big weapons. And I can tell you from our experiences, uh, I won't name the company either, but... Uh, you know, we we have also seen situations where um, uh, the content marketing team of a company um, uh, can get no support from the social media team, which you would think would be part of the content marketing team. Just thinking out loud here, but um, uh, you know, uh, it, and this is very common. So this is like I said, the, the whole business of you know, a third of the punches are hitting themselves in the head. So uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, smart and very well-run departments in some of these companies, but even when they're, that's the case, they're looking at a much broader scale than you are, right? And you always, always will have that focus as your advantage. Exactly. And I think, again, it's what Mark said earlier, which I thought is brilliant. It's, it's a great equalizer. Suddenly... You know, we were hoping the web would provide that great equalizer, and evidently it didn't, because those who had deeper pockets might to scale faster and have a slicker experience. But now, thanks to social media, it has become really difficult to actually gain any kind of foothold if you're trying to create a sort of mass leveraging effect. So that leaves large companies with big budgets and large teams standing still at the moment, which allows smaller operators to actually become um, big players, but being nimble, but being personal, but being personable. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to look to the uh, uh, questions here again. Do you have one ready? Uh, yeah, I can. I can throw. Let's let's switch directions here for a moment. Uh, Gary Nicodemus asks, how can semantic search work with voice recognition technology like Glass? Fantastic. Okay, that's an excellent question because right now, in our days, um, just a couple of days ago, we had two um, new developments in terms of voice recognition. Uh, one is that Google um, Chrome works now uh, as a hands-free device. It can actually carry out search using your voice, hands-free, on Chrome, on any device. And this is a new development. And the second thing is we have voice and we have um, speech typing or voice dictation in Google Docs. So basically you'll be able to dictate to Google Docs and they'll be able to type it up. And this is being um, implemented just a couple of days ago and it's being rolled out across the, the world. Now, these are huge leaps in technology in terms of how we're using our voice and our speech patterns to control search. And it's in preparation for Google Glass. It means that um, Google is scaling its voice recognition efforts, which are purely semantic, I must say, to a, a quite a high level of um, understanding, which means that when we get to Google Glass, we're going to have another massive leap as um, Google Glass is basically controlled primarily by voice. You can, I mean, you can use your hands if you want, but it becomes a little bit awkward. Now, all these things will help scale semantic search faster because they will give us um, different types of search queries because they're natural language based. They will give us a different way of looking for things because it becomes a little bit harder to look for keywords if you're using natural speech. Certainly some keywords may be there naturally, but you know, it's the kind of thing that you can't really, you know, it's much easier to say, you know, show me all the um, alcoholic beverages made of barley and go beer, whiskey, I, ale, you know, which is <laughs> the kind of thing which is a lot harder to actually <laughs> Uh, visualize when you're actually talking about it. Um, and, and this will change, again, our relation to search, but also because, you know, if we go back to the diagram that um, Eric shared in the beginning, because it's a Venn diagram between um, search and us and technology, it will change, again, the way technology is scaling. It will change how quickly search understands what we are doing at a personal level, and it will basically um, accelerate things a lot faster for search and certainly for us. Absolutely, and I think one of the things that's true, too, is that um, the, the use of voice as the method of uh, making search uh, command requests is likely to drive a lot more natural language search uh, and much more semantically rich queries, which uh, uh, actually bring out a lot more intent. Yes. And, uh, exactly. and that actually makes the job of semantic search... Uh, uh, easier, right? Um, there's, a, there's a parsing part where people are more likely to speak sentences, right, and issue entire, uh, um, you know, explanation of what they want. Uh, but but the but the data is there now to actually extract that information and make use of it. Yes, yes, exactly. And it's a kind of um, that kind of um, basically uh, cooperation, if we can call it that, between us and the technology and certainly what the publishers of content are doing because they will also begin to change in response that begins to it begins to contribute to this uh, massive scaling and, and acceleration of, the, of, of search. Yeah, absolutely. So a uh, question from Ian Curl. I want to say hi to Ian. Ian's a good friend. He's probably sitting about eight miles away from me right now. Hi, Ian. Oh, there you go. So did you see this question with him? No, uh, no, 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 no. This is a... Uh, <laughs> How dependent is semantic search on the semantic web? What okay. factors do you consider to be the last hurdles to transition from algorithmic ranking to semantic search? Um, well, the, the I mean, there's obviously a connection between semantic search and semantic web. But let's um, clarify something. The semantic web, as we used to think about it back in 2001, when Tim Berners-Lee first um, proposed the vision, was entirely different to what we're actually seeing today. And what Tim Berners-Lee proposed at the time was essentially the use of structured data, which was um, end-user generated by us, essentially, and placed on the web in a very um, well-intentioned way in order to help um, the web be indexed better, the data to travel across it to create transparency and authority, pretty much like we're seeing today. It hasn't worked, and the reason it hasn't worked is because the motivation for doing this for us as a person 
is very low indeed because we don't gain very much because basically we're saying you know here's our data we're structuring it and it is quite a, a lengthy um, laborious process we're structuring we're putting it out there so people can use it well you know it might give you a warm glow at night occasionally but you know if you're working under pressure and you're trying to make a living it doesn't give you sufficient motivation to continue doing it for very long so that's why it basically failed which you know it's not a it's not a judgment of human nature, it's a judgment of the realities we actually work against. So what are we seeing in the semantic web today? Essentially what we're seeing in semantic web is the version of the web which Google has indexed. And here comes a big challenge because essentially it's not the web at large, it's only the indexable web. And it's only Google's version of the web. That web is taken into Google, it's structured itself, so it becomes a structured web, a semantic web, and data then makes a lot more sense than it does in the unstructured web. And that's what we're saying. How quickly are we getting there? Well, the problem here is one of scale, but it's not just scale, because scale produces its own problems, of course, but it's also veracity, because there's so much information there which is growing daily that Google has to have the ability to verify that information to a high degree of confidence in order to present it. And that is a, quite a sticking point. Uh, we're not there yet, but it's not something which cannot be overcome. It just takes sufficient degrees of connection the relationship economy, essentially, to allow us to, to create a kind of connection. So how quickly are we going to see it? We have started seeing it in our days right now. So in, in a sense, we are living in a semantic web, thanks to semantic search. But in a fully semantic web, we're probably, you know, at a guess, I'd say another three, four years away, maybe five. Yeah. It's an it's a interesting time, right? So these are the kinds of things that create opportunities for, for people who are smart enough to, uh, to take advantage of them. Uh, so, you know, one really clever idea is you could go out and write a book called Google Semantic Search. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, wait, that's already been done. Oh, right. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. That this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. Um, <laughs> it's been taken, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I mean, for businesses of all sizes, really understanding how this is going to work, uh, and getting yourself in, in line with the implications of it. And I think we talked about that earlier. It gets back to how you're going to create that visible value uh, and, you know, networks of relationships and, um, uh, and, and those kinds of things that give you those signs of trust and authority. Um, you, you know, there, there's a lot of leverage to be gained by actively building those things now. Exactly. And I think the best analogy here is to take, you know, the local neighborhood. You could say, you know, we're all living in little boxes, little houses. We can all sort of go out the front door and just say hi to the person next to you. And that's it. There's no other connection. But suppose you actually go a step further and you make that connection. You make the, you know, the human factor begins to come into play. And within that connection, you also begin to make yourself valuable and, you know, helpful. You say to your neighbor, you know, if you want this, I can help you with it. Well, at some point, this becomes to gain you a certain amount of reputation, more and more people perhaps will seek your help because your neighbor will say to his neighbor that, hey, you know, um, uh, David or Eric or Mark, they're great guys and, you know, they're absolutely fantastic to, to connect with. And because of that small, relatively small helpfulness, we begin to get into a kind of reputational building that can have then a potentially uh, professional impact or work, ex work impact. And, and that's exactly you know, in a small scale, small world example. And if you scale that globally on the web, that's exactly how it works. So it's, you know, it's a way to see it. So uh, as is always the case, we're almost out of time. Uh, if you're up for it, I'm going to push it just a couple of minutes. Yeah, certainly, absolutely. Because I want to uh, uh, take one more question, which I think is interesting. Actually, there's a lot of questions that are interesting. So for those of you that we haven't answered your questions uh, during the show, uh, one or more of us will be jumping in the comments and uh, uh, and and uh, answering them post show. But uh, this one's from Scott Scowcroft. Has the emergence of social media essentially reset the media at uh, the meter, or do the established companies have an inherent advantage because of their incumbent branding? Okay, that's an excellent question, and let's let's look at it because it has several layers here. Now, first of all, it comes the question of brand value, which is what branding is all about. And we frequently talk about our own brand building efforts and how people should behave like brands. And at the same time, we also say, well, brands should behave like people, and just to confuse the picture. So really, let's clarify it now. 
When we talk about brand values, essentially we needed a brand in the past because that was one measure through which we established worth, authority, and trust. And how did we do that? Well, a brand had spent a considerable amount of effort and money in order to build up its reputation. So if, for instance, you happen to like Nike sneakers, you know, it was highly unlikely that Nike would sell you a bad set of sneakers because it wasn't really worth their money for you to buy just one set. They needed you to be, to be happy and keep on buying sets of sneakers in order for them to make money, which is why they invested that into their reputation, and they wanted you to tell their friends about it, which is what, how it worked. So we tended to trust brands. Why do we not trust brands now? Well, we don't trust brands because we have, in a more transparent world, we'll also see that brands have have gone behind, you know, have, have been responsible for a number of behavior sets which are not quite um, as, as, as transparent and equitable as they should be. And they range from, you know, using slave labor sometimes or, you know, uh, child labor in their products to uh, unethical sourcing of the materials to raping and pillaging the planet to basically a price fixing or almost virtual price fixing. And we have seen this kind of behavior. So now just having a brand is no longer enough for, the, for, for them to actually gain our trust. If anything, it works against them. So for them to now gain our trust, they also have to show us their people. And this is really difficult. They have to connect with us at an em empathic level, at the human level, and say, hey, you know, we are also got family, families. We're also trying to earn a living. We also have jobs. We need to do this. And we're here to help you. And the moment they establish a kind of connection, then they also need to share with us their set of values, and we need to buy into the set of values. And you can say, okay, you know, we don't use child labor anymore. We actually, you know, create um, jobs in, I don't know, in, in sub-Sahara Africa, for instance. In which case we think, okay, that's not too bad. I'll pay an extra $50 for that because I think it's worth it. So how do we take that now, the, the behavior onto the personal level? We say people should act like brands. Well, certainly we don't really mean that people should you know, scale their efforts of one to many in a massless, faceless kind of, kind of way, nor do we suggest that people should suddenly become unethical and try to behave like the brands of all should do. But one thing that brands certainly have is consistency. Everything they do, because it's a company, they have a very specific message which is clearly defined in their minds, and they transmit that message or they communicate it in pretty much everything they do. In the past, it was through advertising, slick advertising, and, and clever marketing. Now it's through social activities and social sharing, the social behavior, and the content, and the way they basically behave with us. And that's what we want with people as well. If you're a person, because sometimes it is very easy for us to think we know what we stand for, it becomes very hard for us to actually communicate it. And really, as people, we should actually articulate in our minds. So if, for instance, you know, you can say that, you know, in my case, I do semantic search. It's not the only thing I do, and I do a lot of different things. But in my mind, one of the things which I have set a goal for myself is to demystify the subject and I seize every opportunity I can, even you know, through articles, hangouts on air, um, uh, video or radio interviews, and I actually make it as accessible as possible. And that has become a guiding principle for me. So if somebody says, you know, let's get online and we discuss the technicalities of semantic search for SEOs, well, that might be great, it might appeal to me. It's not what I do, though, gradually, because it's not really my audience. All it does is makes me feel good because I'm there with peers discussing something technical. So that is something which I probably wouldn't do. And that's because it doesn't fit in with my um, message, if you like. And that's how people behave like brands. It allows for a certain amount of consistency, which leads, again, to clarity, so people know what you do. And, and that's where the two actually meet. Yeah, and I, I just add, uh, to me, uh, to some degree, to Scott's go cross question, I actually do think that social media does uh, uh, re remake the, the landscape because... Um, you know, hey, look, um, let, let's see if we can find a former school teacher who's made himself into a brand on Google+. Plus. Does anybody know one of those? Uh, <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> uh, um, um, no, that couldn't possibly true. Well, you know what? That's absurd, so let's even get more absurd. Could you imagine a coal miner, like, uh, quitting his job and then establishing a, a visible presence on a social media network? Inconceivable. <laughs> hey, hey, Wade Harmon, I'm talking about you. So if you don't get a message that you get talked about on this show, I'll be really upset. So, um, so, but my point is that these these situations, because they are uh, disruptions, really, 
they create new opportunities for people to, to, to step up and, and build a presence. And from, from my perspective, when I, when I look at it, we live in the age of disruption, right? The, the rate of disruptive events is accelerating uh, um, in a dramatic way. And that means that there's always going to be new opportunities uh, to, to jump in and do something special and do something different. And, uh, and that can play very, very well for people who, who do that the right way. So um, I think we've probably pushed it as far as we should. Uh, <laughs> Um, it just uh, flies I, by every week. It's just, you know, yeah, no, I, 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 I promised that uh, the three of us would end in a certain state at the end of the show. Uh, and it's like the, okay, where the hell did the time go? Um, that's just the way it is. Uh, any closing comments, uh, guys? Uh, yes, I think um, the subject of semantic searches, I, I know it's more and more troubling because it comes more and more to our awareness, but it's really guided at the end, uh, at, at, at the uh, business level by classic common sense. You know, it's clarity of what we do, how we do it, and how we communicate that. So if you can solve these questions, then everything else is building up on that, and it's got a good foundation, and that's what you need to keep in mind. And Mark? Um, I'm looking forward to Digital Marketing Excellence Show on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to build a semantic connection to, uh, to our other show. Uh, what have you got coming up, David? On uh, or not David? I'm sorry, Eric. On uh, on Thursday. Yeah, so we uh, have Carrie Kirpin from uh, Likeable Media will be joining me. Uh, so we I've met her several times through common clients actually, um, and uh, they've built a very very successful uh, social media uh, um, consulting business and uh, work with a lot of major brands. So. I'm I'm really really looking forward to that show. Um, so you know, hey, I'm just going to add that you know, as I said, this is a great time uh, for smart, aggressive people to be alive and people who can deal with change. Um, if you can deal well with change, then then this is this is it for you. Um, otherwise, you can uh, always consider going to. Um, uh, say the outback in Australia and become an Aborigine and, and you won't have to deal with a lot of change. And, and by the way, there's a lot of advantages to that lifestyle that and actually uh, not meaning to say anything negative about it, but, but I happen to love change, so I'm, I'm enjoying this uh, tremendously. So I think that's it for first Tuesdays with David, and I'm so disappointed that we have to wait uh, four more weeks to do it again. Um, but uh, uh, that's it for the Digital Marketing Answer Show for today. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you for having thank me. You. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye, all.